G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we continue this new 18 team series, the third one I've done this summer or winter here in the UK. And today we're gonna to be talking about the Sydney Swans and some New Year's resolutions for 2024. So I'm working back through all the clubs once again, which means I've done the Bulldogs and the Eagles. You can find that on a playlist called AFL 2024 Resolutions. And essentially the premise of this video is to find some outcomes or goals that teams will have sort of on a micro level to try and obviously improve to some degree in 2024. So uh, I'd like to think I'm going a little bit deeper than simply, oh, they need to make the top four or whatever. Although in some cases that will be true for some teams. Uh, we've, I've gone through each club and I've picked about eight here for the Sydney Swans, uh, where I think if they tick these little boxes, it will ultimately lead to a better outcome overall. So if you're a Sydney Swans fan, you may or may not be aware that uh, I've been doing some team centric content this year, which means that there is a 2024 analysis of the Sydney Swans best 22 on this channel. I'll include a little link to it up the top right of this video. And equally, I've done a video projecting what Sydney's best 22 will look like in three years. I've done that for every club, uh, but if you're a Swans fan, you can find that by clicking the top right icon of this video. So without further ado, let's start talking about the Sydney Swans and what are some little goals that they can tick off in 2024 to rectify some of the things that went wrong in 2023, in some cases anyway. Now, obviously with the Sydney Swans, uh, they had a year in 2023 that didn't go to plan. Um, and it wouldn't be fair to say that they underachieved because I think there were some mitigating circumstances, certainly in the case of injuries, particularly to tall players and defensive options as well. So overall, to, to characterize their 2023 season, the fact that they fought their way back into the finals race and ultimately played uh, finals is in itself a pretty good achievement, even though they fell a few spots down on the ladder. Obviously, uh, well, they finished eighth in the end, having made the grand final the previous year. So considering the mitigating circumstances there, I think it was quite a very decent result for the Swans to come back into finals contention. Although I'm sure that they'll raise their standards a little bit going forward, provided they get a little bit more luck on the injury front. So that leads us into uh, one of my resolutions for the Sydney Swans, and that is to just simply uh, get a better run with injury. And I know to some extent that's out of their control, but in some cases it might not be. But generally speaking, to get a better run of injuries, particularly to their taller stocks, um, should in itself result in better performances and better consistency from Sydney. So uh, let's talk about some of the key def uh, key position injuries they had this year, although some of them were concentrated in the back line. So we'll start with the fact that Paddy McCartan only played four games. Obviously, he sort of evolved into this um, very handy key defender, only to play four games and unfortunately retire. Uh, as I've talked about previously on this channel, but uh, that was one aspect. Tom McCartan, his brother, only played the 15 games, uh, which sounds decent. 15 games isn't absolutely horrid, but when you combine some of these all together, it becomes quite, I would say, devastating to some extent. Sam Reid was a player that missed the entire year through injury. Tom Hickey only played the 12 games. Of course, he is now retired. Buddy Franklin only played 13 games. And across the board, it just seemed like there was a lot of players playing underdone for the Swans in 2023, which uh, sort of restricted them getting any real momentum. Towards the end of the year, it felt like they clicked, their pressure was up, they were clearly playing with a degree of fitness, it has to be said. But overall, um, you know, I think if the Swans can get a better run of injury, particularly to key positional players, that would go a long way to them in itself improving. Um, and I will point out as well, a number of these players have now left the club. So Paddy McCartan only playing four uh, games. Buddy Franklin obviously retired, Tom Hickey retired as well. So like I said, that, that one is a resolution that kind of relies a little bit on luck, but um, obviously there are things you can do from a strength and conditioning point of view um, to help injury prevention, although not if it's a impact injury. But let's talk about something a little bit more in their control, and that is to probably find a backline that functions in particular with uh, Joel Hamlin coming into this back line. So that's one thing the Swans kind of lack is a, is a true best 22 key position defender that they can really hang their hat on. Obviously, Joel Hamling comes in uh, to sort of replace uh, Paddy McCartan. If I'm looking at their best 22, like I mapped out in the in a previous video, I, I probably go with Hamling and Tom McCartan as the two key backs that I would select uh, first. And then maybe Melikan is the third. I'm not too sure if there's a dynamic where all three of those play. It is entirely possible and possibly depends on the opposition as well. But in terms of raw like uh, talent and star power, this is probably the part of the ground where they are the least strong. So I guess the resolution here is to find a dynamic where they can function well as a backline despite the lack of actual star power there. So Hamling has been an accomplished player in previous years. Uh, you know, he's a premiership player for the Bulldogs, right? So 
The other thing with him, though, is he's only played six games in three years. So for them, it's a case of optimizing that and getting the best out of Hamling. It might be a stopgap solution. Obviously, he's towards the back end of his career. I think he's around about 30 years old. But obviously, the back line was, a, was an area that sort of plagued them in 2023. So if they can find a dynamic that works there with Hamling, McCartan, and potentially Melican, there's also Patrick Snell, who they just drafted, and probably some other options that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But in terms of their, their best mix, whatever it is, they've got to try and find that this year. The next resolution is, and uh, I will again reiterate that these are in no particular order, uh, but a more of a broad one, and that is to simply return to contention. So like I said, the 2022, they were fantastic. The year ends in a very not ideal fashion, losing the grand final by 81 points, and there does seem to be this trend of when teams lose a big grand final, they, uh, they then struggle to back it up the following year. And I wouldn't say that really applies to Sydney. I think they came back with the with the right enthusiasm. I think there was just some mitigating circumstances. And sure, they didn't play their absolute best football. Some players regressed. Some other players ex- exploded, like Errol Golden. But the way they really rallied towards the second half of the year, made the finals, obviously bowed out to Carlton, who were were one of the most red-hot teams in the competition around that time. It does show, at least to me, that that uh, that grand final appearance wasn't a one-hit wonder and that they will be back. And that's why I think they should set the expectation of becoming a genuine premiership contender again in 2024. I think the team is good enough. Certainly the midfield's good enough. The forward line is talented enough. Even the back line, despite me saying that maybe the tall options there aren't as probably strong on paper as other clubs, it is still a good defensive unit when you consider the other players in that mix. They're a great pressure side as well, and that they proved that towards the back end of 2023. And I do think they just have that capability of certainly surging back into the top four and being there deep in September as well. And I think that should be the baseline expectation for Sydney. Again, allowing for a half-decent injury run, they should set themselves the goal of being in the mix for that as well. And then this flow-on benefits to that as well, where if Sydney can prove they have premiership potential, Suddenly, you know, if they in 12 months decide they want to attract a genuine best 22 key position defender, that's an example. Being a good quality side will certainly help that factor. It may also help them with uh, potential retention issues, which I will allude to later in this video. So the only thing that I think uh, from an on-field point of view as well that could function a little bit better is their forward line, which leads me to the next resolution, and that's coming up with a rock solid forward line dynamic in the absence of Buddy Franklin. Now I will preface this and say that I know that Buddy Franklin only played 13 games, he only kicked 19 goals, and it has been a while since they've been reliant on Buddy Franklin. So I don't mean to oversell that particular narrative, but nonetheless, I think finding a functioning uh, forward line dynamic, or at least developing the one that's already in place. We know that their medium forwards are really strong. Tom Papley is one of the best in the business. Isaac Heaney kicked 30 goals this year and probably had a down year. I think he kicked 49 in 2022. So there's upside there. But in terms of goals from Tolls, uh, I think Logan McDonald was their leading goal scorer for outside of uh, Tom Papley. So he kicked 32 goals from 20 games, and that's fairly promising when you consider he's only 21 years of age. Joel Amati as well showed some good signs. He kicked 20 from 15 games and kicked three bags of four. I think he's about 24 years of age. So I guess the long-winded point I'm making here is sort of nurturing that dynamic and seeing it improve. And I do think it certainly has the capability. I'm in particular a big fan of Logan McDonald, and we could see potentially a big year from him. And I think a big year for, for Logan McDonald could just be 45 goals, which is you know modest when you're comparing it to probably the common leaders. But I think a 45 goal output season from Logan McDonald would really give Sydney a massive boost in terms of you know playing deep into finals. So with that being said, I think Logan McDonald does um, loom as an important part of this forward line mix with their mediums already good. Getting a really strong, reliable, tall target up there, which I believe he will become. Is, uh, is a really important aspect. And that leads me to the next resolution, which is to retain Logan McDonald. So uh, again, this is I'm bringing this up because Logan McDonald is out of contract at the end of 2024 and will be a highly sought after talent. And I'm not ne- necessarily suggesting that he is likely to leave, but you factor in that he is one of the more talented key position prospects that has developed to some extent that has shown enough to suggest that he will be a very good player in a few years, which means that clubs like Fremantle, one of the West Australian clubs, dare I say at West Coast will have a crack. I'm not sure why you'd want to go there. And uh, and the Collingwood Football Club as well, another team that needs a key position forward. And I believe Logan McDonald was a Collingwood fan as an aside. So club's going to come hard for him. And I would be surprised if he left Sydney. I think their retention generally is pretty good. And like I said, it kind of flows into this idea of if, if Sydney can prove themselves to be uh, a team with premiership potential, not necessarily win the premiership next year, but a side that is within striking distance of a flag, then that will help retain players 
like Logan McDonald. So I think it probably will happen. They'll keep him, but nonetheless, it is going to be one of their more important off-field focuses in 2024. And I'll also mention that guys like Will Hayward, Ollie Florent are both out of contract. And I think uh, Ollie Florent will certainly be a free agent, if I'm not mistaken. They might actually both be. So those are both things to consider. The next resolution for them is to get the best out of Brody Grundy, um, which I probably could have mentioned earlier, but, but like I said, these are in no particular order. However, their ruck situation is an area they need to address. So obviously we talked about Hickey having some injuries earlier this year. Um, now he's retired. Peter Laddams hasn't really come on in the way that they had anticipated. So getting a big boost in the ruck stocks would be a massive plus to Sydney. Now, Brody Grundy, obviously, is coming off a year at Melbourne where he was recruited, sort of shoveled into a forward ruck role, um, and that that experiment kind of failed, and uh, the Ds have moved him on. Unsurprisingly, his hitouts dropped by a third in 2023. What I will say, though, is you, you look at Brody Grundy's last couple of years in Collingwood, and he certainly wasn't at his elite standard. So I don't think it's as simple as a case of make him the number one ruck, and he's going to be an absolute star again. He did drop off slowly at Collingwood, but it was still at a reasonable output considering in his last season at Collingwood he had 19 touches a game and 32 hit outs. Now I think that if he can replicate that at the Sydney Swans that gives them a big boost to their best 22. There's also a lot to be said for his connection with Taylor Adams. I think I forget the exact stats but those two combined a lot for clearances back in 2019 and that was probably his best season. I think he had 40 hit outs a game and 20, 21 disposals and the thing about Rux is yes he's going to be turning 30 next year but there's nothing to suggest that he's going to necessarily decline. So I think there is potential for Brody Grundy to get somewhere near his best. I'm not going to back him in to be all Australian or anything like that. But if he can get back to where he was sort of at Collingwood before they started to sort of sideline him, I think that would be a massive win for both Brody Grundy and the Sydney Swans. A couple of other resolutions to rattle off towards the end. Uh, find a way to cover Callum Mills. So obviously Callum Mills, um, what much has been reported on, on what happened at the uh, Mad Monday. He's injured his shoulder. I think it's a reconstruction. He certainly had uh, shoulder surgery. So he's going to be out of football for a little while next year. And I'm not 100% sure how long that is. I, I tried to do my research on that, but I, I estimate maybe half a year for a big surgery like he's having. Uh, but hopefully it's earlier than that. And he certainly should be back sometime in 2024, but it does create this hole in the best 22. Now we do know that they recruited Taylor Adams, uh, which is an interesting one because I believe Taylor Adams actually kind of initiated um, that particular move. But nonetheless, it's come at a good time for them to, to cover a midfield spot. Callum Mills in 2023 didn't quite have the same output as the previous two years. I think in 22 and 21 even, he had really, really good numbers. But nonetheless, still an important player, an important leader in that team. And uh, finding a way to mitigate his absence will be an important focus for them. Which leads me to my next resolution as well, which is probably that this might create an opportunity outside of Taylor Adams to expose some of these younger midfielders at Sydney. So one player I've talked about a lot is uh, Angus Sheldrick. He's played just nine games at AFL level, did play seven of them in 2023 and won a Rising Star nomination as well. And I think probably just a bit of a undervalued gun in the comp or has that potential. Not necessarily Brownlow potential, but he could be a very, very good midfielder at the Sydney Swans should he get his opportunity. And that could happen in 2024 in the absence of Mills. I know that Taylor Adams has come into the side, but nonetheless, we could see opportunities for these guys like Sheldrick to really develop their games. Because I think if Sheldrick has another year where he plays less than five games, we're probably treading into the territory where his development is probably uh, being sacrificed a little bit. Another one's Caden Cleary. He's only 18. They just drafted him. But I'm just listing players who could come in to the midfield rotation and add some value. He could do an Errol Golden and just be better than you expect at such a young age. Uh, Corey Warner is another player that they um, have given a few games to and Matthew Roberts as well. I think both of these guys have played less than 10 games. Could we see more of them in 2024? Bottom line is the resolution is sub simultaneously to find a way to cover Callum Mills' absence in the first half of the year and also give some exposure to some of their talented young guys, in particular Angus Sheldrick, who I think is at the developmental level where he probably needs games to really improve as a footballer. So that's my take on the Sydney Swans and I've uh, picked eight resolutions for them. I've tried to be fairly honest and Maybe a little bit harsh with the way I talked about their key back options, but I think I think that's fairly obvious. Nonetheless, though, guys, I do look forward to your feedback in the comments section below. Um, and certainly, you know, let me know. Pull me up on things you disagree with, but also add some resolutions that I might have missed because I'm sure you can find up to 50 for any given list. So as always, I appreciate you watching. I hope you're subscribed to the channel. And either way, I hope you have a nice day. I'll see you in the next one, guys. Cheers.